Welcome every morning with a smile. Look on the new day as another special gift from your creator. Another golden opportunity to complete what you were unable to finish yesterday. Today will never happen again. We welcome you all to the second day of national level virtual training on DNA barcoding. I now request Dr. A.S. Priscilla, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, Lady Doe College, to introduce the guest speaker. Good morning and blessed day to everyone gathered here virtually. It's always a great pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Reginald Victor, retired professor, former director, Center for Environmental Studies, former Dean of Research, Sultan Qaboos University, Oman, to the second day of workshop on DNA barcoding. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today to this virtual team. As a passionate teacher at heart, a phenomenal and meticulous researcher with world-class credentials. Thank you, sir, for always mentoring and guiding us with your expertise in varied aspects of the Department of Zoology. Professor Reginald Victor started his academic journey in American College, Madurai, and received his MSc and PhD degrees from the University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and was the alumni, alumni and he won the alumni gold medal uh, from among seven competing faculties. He had published 24 research papers by the time he finished his PhD degree and his groundbreaking research on the meiotic mechanism in association with another colleague is still a much quoted work in the textbooks of animal cytology. After continuing in Waterloo as a postdoctoral fellow for a year, he won the prestigious Humboldt Fellowship in Germany However, he joined the University of Benin, Nigeria as a senior lecturer and served there till 1989. He arrived at Sultan Qaboos University, Oman, in the same year and was promoted as a full professor. He then headed the Department of Biology there for seven years and was appointed as the founding director of the Center for Environmental Studies and Research. And then in 2010, he was appointed as the first Dean of Research and served in that capacity till 2013. Professor Victor shared his research career as a freshwater biologist, but has also worked on diverse fields in biology and environmental science. He is an international authority on tropical freshwater astrocods and has carried out pioneering research on African rivers and floodplains with reference to the applied ecology of stream macrobenthos and freshwater fish. In Oman, his research interests included the ecology and conservation of coastal lagoons, water quality issues in mountain streams, ecology of extreme environments like thermal streams, and biodiversity and sustainable development in arid mountain ecosystems. Professor Victor has published 194 uh, research contributions as of today, including journal articles of 124 numbers, monographs and books, 18 numbers, and conference papers, 22, 52 numbers. He has supervised over 40 research students from BSc honors to doctoral levels. Professor Victor is an accomplished biostatistician who teaches data handling in addition to his specializations in ecology and environmental studies. His training course on environmental impact assessment uh, is annually offered at Sultan Qaboos University and is considered a, as a must course for environmental professionals. He has collaborated with Lady Doe College twice in conducting biostatistics workshops. And I can vouch to say that it is a much sought after training. Professor Victor is an internationally recognized environmental scientist he was one of the key members of the drafting committee that wrote the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan for Oman. He was the chairman of the most important subcommittee on terrestrial and freshwater biodiversity that contributed to uh, Oman's biodiversity. He advises the Ministry of Regional Municipalities and Water Resources 
and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Affairs in Oman on environmental issues. He serves on the advisory panel of the committee dealing with research on arid zone biodiversity at the Third World Network of Scientific Organizations, Italy, and is also linked to various organizations like UNESCO, UNEP, and IUCN on arid zone issues. Professor Victor is the coordinator for mountain development issues in the MENA region. He develops proposals for consideration at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, and he also acts as a reviewer for international journals, research proposals, and is a much sought after consultancy uh, reporting. Today, we have with us a seasoned and top class scientist to lead us through the topic hidden diversity, delimitation of cryptic species, and phylogeography of the Cyprinid Gara species complex in northern Oman. Eagerly waiting to hear from you, sir. Thank you, Priscilla, yes, uh, for a very glorified uh, introduction. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I hope my talk will live up live up to the reputation you you introduced me to. So now the now the onus is on me to prove myself so, to the audience. Okay. So before you start, I request all the participants to unmute their videos for the photo session. Thank you. Thank you all. Now Thank I invite uh, Dr. Reginald Victor, former professor, Department of Biology, Sultan Qaboos University, Oman, to present his guest lecture on hidden diversity, delimitation of cryptic species, and phylogeography of Cyprinid Gara species complex in northern Oman. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, I'm clear. I do not know whether the system is working well, but I hope uh, I'm clear to everybody. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. So I assume that everything is fine. And I want to talk to you about, about this particular topic, which is a research topic. And I thought it was appropriate to talk to you about it because you have been learning the techniques. But the techniques by themselves do not tell you a story. The whole purpose of the technique is to clarify it using various methods and tools to explain the science. Here is an example. This is a case study. So I picked it up. So I'm not going to emphasize too much on the methods, but I'm going to talk about how we use the methods to tell the story about the cryptic species of this particular fish called the Gara. And it is a species complex in Northern Oman. And we will soon talk about, talk about where it is, how it is, and what are the complexes, and how we went about unraveling this mystery. This work was done in association with my colleagues in the University of Vienna and Natural History Museum in Austria. The first author of the paper you see, as our convention dictates, is, my, is our PhD student. And the rest are colleagues who participated in various aspects. And the whole project was controlled by Louis um, and myself uh, for a period of three years or so. And I hope that all of you have the hard copy because sometimes it is easier to look at the hard copy than the slide. And I do not know how many of you read the paper and whether you read the paper and understood everything. But I will assume assume that, that 
you need the clarification and i will go on explaining things although you may know them know them already okay can i move on to the next slide please okay and here in the introduction we have to first talk about the phylogeographic studies and this is very important because when you talk about a species we know want to know the historic background what about the genetic variation what is the distribution of the species and what are the limits nowadays we are beating about the loss of biodiversity everybody talks about loss of biodiversity due to climate change habitat destruction pollution etc 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 but at the same time we do not know much about the hidden species diversity and we are talking about the cryptic species when we say cryptic species these are real species but you cannot morphologically distinguish them from one another the differences are not sufficient enough so we call them by one single name and sometimes we just say well this is this species complex what we are telling is that we don't know whether there are more species hidden in this complex or not and when we do not know what is existing we cannot protect them and so for every ordinary species you think you are losing you may be losing many cryptic species which are sitting inside this complex and with the use of the dna based techniques nowadays we can detect the genetic diversity okay and when we started doing this using techniques like barcoding we now realize that we have underestimated biodiversity very much so what we talk about biodiversity is probably more than what we think that exists in the world okay most of the taxonomists i started my career as a taxonomist because nobody could tell me what ostracards were i were i was looking at and when i asked my supervisor professor george michael from amaraj university at that time madras university he had a simple answer he said well if nobody knows what it is you yourself study them that's how i went into taxonomy and when i went into taxonomy okay sometimes we run into species which looks very similar to each other the morphological traits tell them they are all the same but we can't distinguish them but when i went to canada i took it to the next level and i started looking at the cytotaxonomy the karyotyping chromosome numbers and i was surprised that many species which we called as one species contain the different chromosome numbers in different geographical area that is the next step but now we have far far more we have far more advanced techniques like the dna dna barcoding sequencing the dna and so on and so we have sophisticated tools to look at the same same issue in a different different perspective can i have the next slide please move the slide please okay we will talk about the present study here we, i am talking about one fish genus called the gara it is a cyprinidae when you say cyprinidae it is a carp family and this particular species is very very diverse in the southeastern arabian peninsula it is much more diverse in middle east than in the mediterranean european region okay and it has been believed that 5.3 to 2.68 million years ago during the pliocene there was a lot of mountain building activity in this area in a minute i will show you the mountains but there was a lot of mountain building orogenesis during this period of 5.3 to 2.7 million million years ago at that time this area was considered as an important center of radiation and lot of species must have proliferated in this area this is one opinion people differ in their views whether it is a center of speciation middle east is 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 correct or not is debatable some people say no it was not and they point out that look at the present day situation there are not many species but one thing is for certain this area was very important for biogeographic interchange 
because it was connect in connection with many diverse geographic areas and so there was a lot of movement of species in this in this area it has potentially much higher number of species in the area but many of the species are still not discovered yet so the richness seemingly is low but in reality richness may be high and if we use this modern techniques molecular techniques dna barcoding and so on we may be able to discover more diversity in this area can i move on to the next slide please just move okay if you look at the landscape of northern oman it, it is very mountainous it has lot of mountain ridges and it goes up to 3000 meter yesterday i read in the newspaper some visitor visiting oman said that it doesn't look like oman it looks like switzerland because in these mountains they have there it is snowing now the whole mountain is covered with snow and people think that am i in oman or am i in switzerland or where that kind of varied climate it goes from very hot to very cold and it is arid it is very dry the precipitation is irregular seven years it may not rain and sometimes it may rain in such a massive way then everything will get washed out so there are extreme weather and in this kind of environment very few animals can survive the fresh water dependent animals have to be well adapted to live in this kind of an area one minute there is no water next minute there is flood and the next minute it goes dry again so somebody who has to adapt to this situation has to be very hardy naturally not many can many can live in this and this is why people said that well species diversity is low but what we are finding is that there are more but we do not know how many more are there okay and this particular gara is abundant throughout the hajar mountain range in northern oman and also in the united arab emirates into which this mountain passes through it inhabits all kinds of water bodies even the artificial water drainage system you can find this gara genus and because of this highly structured landscapes and habitats this particular species are quite isolated but many people said oh they are mixing with each other all the time this may not be the case they may not be the case because there are lots of barriers which prevent them the drainage systems are not all flowing into one area some go east some go west some go north and so there is a possibility that there are a lot of isolating mechanisms operating and this might have separated the species so this is a suspicion with which we started the present study can i move on to the next slide please this is the picture of the gara species complex and generally the gara barimia looks like this if you ask anybody going into the freshwater system pick up this fish and say what is it he will say gara barimia everybody says gara barimia are you sure it is gara barimia he will say i think it is gara barimia are you really sure people will start saying i am maybe i have to check but in this right hand side picture you see a variety and this variety is a blind variety of the same species if you look very closely it has an eye but it can't see the eye is non functional but it lives only in the cave ecosystem this is the this is the specimen or this is the species which we think is a different species now is the one which triggered this study louis my colleague she came to oman and she wanted to know whether there is any genetic difference between the blind fish and the surface living fish we call them epigean representatives which are outside on the surface hypogean representatives which are underneath the surface so her curiosity was whether there is any gene flow between these two populations outside the cave and inside the cave but we can talk the whole day about the blind fish this particular fish but we, that is not the purpose of this seminar so i am not going to go into that there are very many interesting stories 
about about this particular blind blind cave fish but we are not going to go into that now so let us just move on to the next next slide the first study as i said louis is krokenhauser and she wanted to analyze the populations of barimia in northern oman genetically as i said it is the difference between the cave population in a particular cave called al huta cave and then the surface dwelling population and when she was looking at the mitochondrial lineages she found p distances which are separated by about 11% this gave her an idea anything more than 10% is a good chance that that we are talking about differences between two species they may not be the same species but this is highly controversial later on if there are any questions asked during this seminar i will be able to talk about the use of p distances in separating the species but right now her suspicion was that there is approximately 11% difference between these two groups of populations and there was another species which was described called gara rupa and this was sitting right now right in the middle of this barimia complex originally we thought it is a monophyletic taxa it all is one particular thing giving rise to different branches and based on this information she started wondering whether it is monophyletic at all later on there was another subspecies which was described by krug called the galaheri and then it was raised to a species level at a later stage and this particular study planted the seed for this study which we are talking about and when we said that the scope is very very big we put two phd students onto the project one to study the morphological aspects of the complex and the other one to study the genetic aspects of the of the of the complex sandra was the one who did the genetic genetic uh, study and arthur pitchler studied the morphological part morphological part is another paper and that is another another altogether another study we are not going to talk about it we will just move on with this study let us go to the next slide please okay and when she was doing this also there is another subspecies called the shockensis and this was only found in the united arab emirates and it was not genetically investigated pitchler as i told you he looked at the morphological variations and he could not find very many morphological differences between the populations then we said okay we will look at it molecular genetics and see whether there is any any phylogenetic lineages of this taxa which are in this complex in northern oman move on to the next slide please we have to address certain questions when we are doing this if i am presenting is in a in a in a seminar hall i won't use this slide because the lettering is too small but you are all in front of a computer so you can easily read this okay what we did was first of all we increased the sample size okay and we started using a extended set of molecular genetic markers and we started asking the question the first question is to what extent is the genetic variation is within and between populations of this complex in northern oman then the second question is the subspecies shaukanses is it genetically differentiated from the original barimia barimia or it is the same then the third question is can we detect gene flow between the lineages discovered by crook and hauser in 2011 then the genetic groups can we distinguish them and if we distinguish the genetic groups can we put them on top of their geographic distribution in the mountain complex and see that each genetic group belongs to a particular sub geographical region this is another thing which we wanted to look at then the age old question whether it is monophyletic or non monophyletic we can build a dna based phylogenetic tree as suggested by lewis crokenhauser and then can we find out whether the monophyletic story is true or not 
then the genetic results are they in concordance with the morphological data published there were variations pitcher was saying yeah, there are variations but i couldn't tell the variation well he could tell because he's a specialist but an ordinary person couldn't tell we will see the reason for that in a minute somewhere somewhere along the presentation but anyway this is something which we wanted to know whether there is any correlation between the morphological data and the genetic data can we move to the next slide please so what did we do so while finding the answers to these questions we analyzed three mitochondrial marker sequences as well as 19 polymorphic nuclear non coding microsatellite markers and we covered many sites in the mountain covering the whole distribution area of the gara complex this is why i said we increased the sample size that was very important then we started using these marker sequences and the microsatellite markers then we also looked at the genetic divergence of other species of gara in the in the area the results presented here follow the original taxonomy morphological taxonomy <coughs> morphological taxonomy which was accepted in 2016 we took it as the base study okay this is where we start then we put our genetic results on top of that and see whether it, it is in concordance or it is going to vary then our findings with the other additional morphological data and genetic analysis can we revise the gara species complex taxonomically can we provide a revision of the whole complex this is now a separate paper by krishna et al 2020 and the whole gara species complex is now revised based on on this study which we conducted uh say about four four years ago three years ago or something something like that okay let us move on to the next slide please this gives you a whole idea of the study area and you see oman oman is in the arabian peninsula southeast side and the bigger map shows you the the area of the study here if you look at the coastal plain there is a land between the sea sea of oman and the mountain called the hajar mountains these are the northern mountains and there is a space, there is a plain coastal plain and this is a unique coastal plain so we took this as one area and then there is a area called samel gap literally it is a it is a gap between the western hajar mountain and the eastern hajar mountain so the mountain chain is divided into two areas west and east but it is divided by the samail gap and this is one of the geographical barriers for the movement of species from west to east so we took that as as an area then the jabal akhtar is what we call the green mountain it is the largest structural domain in the area and so we took that and then wadi hibi we took it separately because if every body is flowing towards the ocean this goes in the opposite direction so we said okay we will we will look at that body because it is doing something very different from the other what is a dry river seasonal river during season it will flow during dry season it will be dry so that that is what we in arabic it is called wadi okay and the al hajar al sharqi is the eastern hajar mountain that is the other half of the mountain so like if you look at it we had we had 56 sampling sites we had 632 specimens in the complex and we looked at four species which are already known in the complex barimia galahari rufa and sagilia which are all part of the part of the analysis can I, can i move on to the next slide please this is just an album to show you how varied the environment is This is a village called the Alkisha in the in the mountains you can see how how deep it is sitting inside the ravine and if a fish is living in this wadi it is going upstream to the next wadi is very difficult 
So it is, it is, it is, it, there are lots of barriers like this which exist. Can I move on to the next slide, please? This is one of the Gara habitats, a very controversial habitat. In 1977, there was a species described called the Longipinus. Now people are raging about whether it is the same species or not. And so we were not sure whether to include it. So at that time, it was called the Barimia. We said, well, we will see whether there is genetically different or not. So we, this is the particular area from where that fish was originally collected, called Alain. Move on to the next slide, please. Next week. Yeah, this is a village with terrace, terrace cultivation. And every village has a wadi and a fallage which is an artificial stream and springs and so on and so forth. And just to give you the varied habitat of the mountains, next slide, please. And this is another, another valley going into from 2,900 meters. If you follow the valley, you will go to 900 meters. So this is again, altitudinal differences will affect, will affect the distribution of the fish. Go on to the next slide, please. This is another wadi, and here you can see a dam built there. And these dams are nowadays forming artificial barriers. But these dams are not new dams. These are new dams because they were built on old dams, which are thousands of years old. There were original traditional dams, but they are replaced by modern, dam, modern dams these days. But they were so isolating the water body because the, wa the water never left the dam. It was always on one side of the dam, traditionally for thousands of thousands of years, with its own fauna, flora, and so on. Okay, let us move on to the next slide, please. Okay, now we come to the materials and methods, and this is an easy part because I don't have to cover that. You have spent the whole day studying the materials and methods. So the first thing, of course, is the DNA extraction, PCR amplification, and sequencing. And I'm only highlighting, highlighting the areas which may be of interest to you. And when you are studying fish, I thought in your training manual, you were using uh, earthworms, but here we are using uh, bony fish. So what we did was we took the tissue from the fin, fin clips provided, and we used that tissue for, for extracting the DNA. And I'm not going to talk about what kit we used because you may be using a different kit and uh, we are using a different kit. It all depends on the availability and uh, what we use in our labs. And if you look at the mitochondrial markers, which we use the cytochrome oxidase one and cytochrome B and the control region. And for the control region, we had an amplicon for CR long, and then we edited the sequence for CR, CR short. And this is all following the procedure used by Crook and Hauser in 2011. And for PCR amplification, we used various mitochondrial uh, sequences. And this is provided in table, supporting table S2 of the original paper. You have the original paper with you. And if you look at the, look at the table S2, yes, it will tell you how we did the PCR amplification using the very, uh, for various uh, mitochondrial sequences. In addition to this, we profiled 19 microsatellite loci using primers that were specifically designed for Barimia et al. This was the job of uh, Sandra Krishna, and she designed specifically designed primers to profile the microsatellite loci. But whether you are designing primers in this particular training session, I have no idea. Uh, I think probably not, but, but we, we had to do that. And in this study also, when we say genotype, we are talking about the micro satellite allele composition characteristic of a particular population. That's what we mean whenever we mention genotype. And these 19 micro sat sat satellite loci are very useful, again, in, in doing the genetic uh, analysis, in addition to the conventional markers which we use for the mitochondrial DNA. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Then, as usual, we aligned. You would see this in your training. I think today also you will continue with that. 
and we will align we align them then we did a lot of sequence diversity statistics and phylogenetic reconstructions using various methods i will mention the methods as we go along then we did the genetic diversity of the non controlling uh, microsatellite uh, data then the population structure analysis and differentiation and in order to do that we used several software programs and we used various models model verifications and statistical analysis which are all very sophisticated and you will see all these details in the paper which i have provided you as a hard copy so if you want to detail you want the details of the methods and you want to follow them you want to use the same method same chemicals whatever you have all the details available in the original original paper nowadays we provide a lot of supporting documents with these papers and these supporting documents give supporting data so that you know like everything including the raw information is there for you to use and repeat if you want can i go on to the next slide please now we will talk about the results in the results first one i want to talk about is the variation in the mitochondrial sequences the length of the final alignment is 850 base pair for cytochrome oxidase 1109 base pairs for cytochrome b and 8000 sorry 818 base pairs for the mitochondrial controlling region long is 76 positions and short iteration is 382 positions in length all the three markers were analyzed for gara barimia using the 41 specimens in the 23 sampling sites representing all the different clades so combined with the sequences from other taxa what we did was we concatenated the alignment comprised of 47 sequences which had a total length of about 2739 base pairs the concatenated alignment is the com combination of all the alignments together like the co1 position is 1 to 859 cytochrome b position will be 860 to 1968 the cr long is 1969 to 727339 so so we did them did them together then we use the phylogenetic bayesian inference and the ml tree maximum likelihood tree for reconstruction based on this concatenated mitochondrial alignment resulted in trees presenting the same topology with five distinct geographically separated clades corresponding to geographic regions i will show this in the next slide but you will be better off looking at your original original paper but i will explain what this figure means in the next slide so for now you look at this we will go to the previous slide can you move on to the previous slide please okay so here what we you have to do is there are five distinct geographically separated clades corresponding to five geographic regions okay now we will move to the next next slide and if you look at them there are five clades here okay pink blue orange green and then yellow and each one is a geographical region for the genus we have them separate we kept the galahari which is a subspecies separate because it was very unique then central east north west and then we had the genus east and north and west then central and galahari totally if you count them that will be five we will move to the next slide then i will give you the explanation of that figure 2 okay the bayesian inference tree is based on the concatenated alignment of co1 plus cytochrome b plus cr long okay this is based on 44 individuals of the genus and three individuals of another species which we used as an out group okay so the posterior probabilities and bootstrap values from the maximum likelihood analysis are indicated at the nodes so if you go to the original 
figure and look at the notes, you will find the PP values and the bootstrap values. Notes which are highly supported by both analysis. That is the PP equals one and the bootstrap values are more than 95. We filled it, we put a dot there and we filled it. Now in the same figure, if you look at the cave individuals that will appear on the right hand side of the figure. And similarly, shockances also will appear on the right side of the figure. Then at the end of the figure, you have two gray bars. Okay. This is why it is useful if you have the hard, hard copy of the paper and the figure in front of you. If you keep that in, in front of you, then you will see the gray bars on the right hand side that represent the results of two different species limitation methods. One is the ABGD method, which is called automated barcode gap detection method. And the other one is Bayesian Poisson tree process. Each one is a supportive method for the five clades which we separated using, using the analysis. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, and if you look at the CR long alignment comprising sequences from 314 individuals, we found 143 haplotypes with a maximum genetic distance is around 13%. Okay. And the resulting nearest joining neighbor tree, this is again in a figure in the supporting document in the original paper. It will show you the same five clades, clades which we detected using Bayesian inference and the ML tree, maximum likelihood tree. The same thing will appear in the nearest joining tree. I saw in your training manual how to con construct a nearest, nearest neighbor, sorry, neighbor joining tree. I saw that in your manual. But here we use the Bayesian inference model and the, and the ML, maximum likelihood. And we supported it with the NG tree and they all gave the same result. Again, both species limitation methods yielded five clusters. Remember, we have five clades, five genetic clades, and these two methods, species limitation methods, again gave us five clusters. Both were concordant. The both were giving us the same, same five, five clusters. All right, well, let us move to the next, next slide, please. This is a general information based on the analyzed sequences, mean and maximum P distances, nucleotide and haplotype diversity of Gara barimia. This is a very self-explanatory table. You can see the sequences in the first column, we have them all. Then we go them by clade, central clade, Galahari clade, east clade, north clade, and west clade. Okay. And if you look at it, 177 sequences in central and 54 sequences in base. Haplotype, 132 in all, 55 in central, 7 in Galahari, 14 in east, like that. Then HD is the haplotype diversity. Pi refers to the nucleotide diversity. And then it gives you the mean distance and then the maximum, maximum distance. So this is a summary table giving us the analysis of the sequence, including the mean and maximum P distance, and also the nucleotide diversity and the haplotype diversity of this particular species complex. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay. Now, I want to summarize that information in that previous table in this particular slide. Reading the paper itself will be sometimes many, many students I gave to this paper said that, sir, it is very hard for us to understand this paper. So what I did in this presentation is I summarized the information. Instead of giving you the trouble of reading and trying to, to figure out, I just summarize each table and give you the salient information which is needed for, for, for understanding the was understanding this particular story. Okay, the, in this particular thing, the genetic variation is quite high. 
in all the clades. And within group distances were highest in the west clade. And then I start splitting them for each, each of the marker, like CR, this person, cytochrome B, this marker. North clade, CO, I, CO1 is this percentage. Like that, I'm, I'm splitting them. So, but the summary of the information is the genetic variation is quite high in all the clades. And the within group distances are highest in the West clade. Okay. Concerning the haplodi haplotype diversity, the highest values were found in the West clade and the Gallagher clade also. Then we go to the nucleotide diversity. It was again highest in the West clade. Lowest value of haplotype diversity is in East clade. But again, we split them by marker, by marker, by marker. Okay, CR is this much, cytochrome B is this much, and so we spread them. And Gallagher is a group that exhibits the lowest nucleotide diversity values of all three fragments, CR, CO1, and cytochrome B. So this is the summary of the sequence analysis which we did for the, for the Garabarimia complex. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay. Here, this is a very simple table. And if you look at the top row, it gives you the different clades. C is central, G is gallery, N is north, east, and west. And this gives you maximum intraspecific and interspecific distances between the clades based on CR long. Okay? So it is for only one marker. You have to remember that. In the paper, we have for all the markers, but here it's, I'm just giving you an example. And if you look at the diagonal, that is intraspecific distance in percentage. Central against central, Gallagher against Gallagher, north again, that is intra. Inter is between central and Gallagher, central and north, and so on. So this gives you the distances, intraspecific distances and intraspecific distances maximum distances between the between the clades based on one single marker which is CR long. Go to the next slide please. Okay. This is now based on the next marker, CO1 oxidase, cytochrome oxidase one. And the same information, maximum intraspecific and interspecific distances based on the second marker, which we use CO1. Go to the next slide please. This is for the third marker, cytochrome B, the same information. Okay, so this gives us what is the intraspecific distances and what are the intraspecific distances between the between the five five clades which we have we have found. Go to the next slide. Okay, this is a very interesting figure. I will explain this figure again. But what you see here is I want you to look at the top one and understand the concept. One has a lot of trees. It, it has trees. And this is a median joining network. And this is based on the CR haplotypes of the mitochondrial clades. OK? So we used only the CR haplotype for the five clades. And we constructed median joining networks. And then the maps show you different information. In the maps, you get different information. And now when I go to the next slide, I will explain this. Then at our own convenience, you can go back and refer to it. Okay? Just look at the picture as a picture now. And there is a median joining network. There are two maps. What these are, I will explain in the next slide. Can I go to the next slide, please? Okay. Now, this is a median joining network based on CR haplotype, which I have already told. We color coded them. Remember, central is pink, Gallagher is blue, east is orange. Here, in this particular figure, we only put three clades. Space consideration. 
we put two maps one containing three clades the other containing two clades you will see them in a minute and if you now when i am talking <coughs> keep the diagram keep the figure in front of you on your i am talking to the slide i want you to look at when i explain the slide i want you to look at the figure right keep the figure in front of you and i will start and then you will understand what the figure is first we are going to talk about the median joining network okay now you see the circles in the figure each circle is a haplotype and if you see it in the network in the median joining network each circle is of different size all the circles are not of same size but they are of different size and the size of the circle tells you how many number of individuals we used for the same haplotype which is which is sharing that particular circle okay each circle is a haplotype depending upon the size of the circle you will see five individuals in this haplotype 50 individuals in this 50 individuals larger circle five individuals smaller circle and the colors there are colors inside the circle okay the colors are indicating the sampling sites where did this come from where exactly did we find this sample from so that is also shown in that in that median joining network and then you see cross beams on the connecting lines between haplotypes these haplotypes the various circles are connected to each other and there are cross beams on them and these cross beams represent substitution and there are small black dots between haplotypes okay there are small dots i hope you are looking at the picture and these small black dots symbolize hypothetic haplotypes we didn't find them in our data but the median joining network told us that between this there should be a hypothetical haplotype you don't have it in your data but it that it, it is where it should be so we put it there then we have a small map the small map tells you the distribution area of each of the clade as well as the jo detailed geographic origin is in the bigger map so the bigger map gives you the detailed geographic origin the small map gives you the distribution of each of the mountain clade sorry mitochondrial clade can we go to the next slide please okay this is the same thing as the previous one but we are separating the two different clades so here north and west before 3 here 2 but the information is the same go to the next slide please it is a repeat of figure 3 it explains the same information okay now north is green west is yellow each circle represents a haplotype size of the circle i first didn't want this slide but then repeating it twice will make you understand so if you look at it size of the circle is the number of individuals color sampling size cross beam is substitution dot hypothetical haplotype distribution area of each small map big map gives you the overall distribution okay so now all the five clades we have we have given and this is the median joining network based on the cr haplotypes of the mountain clades okay let's go to the next slide please this gives this picture gives you the population structure keep this page open in front of you all right now we'll go to the next slide and you have the picture in front of you now i explain the population structure the complete data set is on the top look at the look at the picture the complete data set is on the top and the subsets each clade is given in the bottom for the complete data set the most probable number of clusters are 5 you can count them horizontally 
five clusters. For subsets, for subsets, they are vertical, and you can count them against structure analysis. If you look at the first one, there are two clusters. Okay, and in the Galahari, there is only one cluster, blue. In the east, orange, there are two clusters. Okay, and three in the north, in the green, and three in the west, yellow. So this gives you a details of the population structure based on the complete data set and based on the bottom, bottom uh, subset. Okay, let us move on to the next slide, please. This is the geographic map of the study area showing sampling sites used for macro satellite analysis. Now we have moved on to the macro satellites, not the mitochondrial markers. Micro satellites, we are looking at the geographic map of the study area and how they are distributed. Go to the next slide. I will explain this. Keep this figure in front of you, map in front of you, then I will explain. This is the Northern Oman. The sampling sites used for microsatellite analysis, we indicate them as a pie chart. We didn't put a dot to say that this is where distribution of microsatellite is, but we put a pie chart. The pie chart has different colors, okay? And that color reflect which is the cluster of affiliation, whether it belongs to the East clade or Galahari clade or Central clade, that is shown in the pie. So the microsatellite marker is given not only as a distribution, but also as what clade is represented where, okay? Let us go to the next slide, please. Now, this is the genetic variability within the groups or clusters, okay? In order to assess the genetic variation among and between population, we calculated descriptive statistics. And we did this for nine polymorphic unlinked macro, micro satellite loci, okay? And here, if you look at them, look at them, these, I will explain all of them, but, but this is available in your paper. Keep this table in front of you. Just take one table, central only, but it will contain for other, other clades, but only central. Keep this table, open your paper in front of you and keep that open. Now I will explain in the next slide. Okay, this is just to show you what table I am going to talk about. And this talks about genetic variability within groups, within the clusters. So we are going to deal with cluster by cluster by cluster. All right. Okay. Now, if you look at the central, in central, there are two sectors, all and then C1 and C2. Okay. Like that, we will do it for every one of them. But I am only showing only one. So keep this table in front of you. Go to the next slide. We'll go to the next slide and I will explain. Go to the next slide, please. Hello. Okay. Now, in that table, you have the table population. N means number of analyzed individuals. NA means number of alleles per population. A means number of alleles per locus. AR means allelic richness. PA is the number of private alleles. PA percent is percentage of private alleles per population based on actual amount of alleles per population. HO means observed heterozygosity over all loci. HE means expected heterozygosity over all loci. FIS inbreeding coefficient, P means the value for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and LD loci, that is deviation from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and do not exhibit any microsatellite micro null alleles. LP percentage should be LD percentage and that should be polymorphic loci for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's a global test and all this is used a software called 
Gen Gen Al X software. This will give you a complete genetic analysis of the microsatellite markers to show the variation within the different different gene. So each symbol pop means population, n means number of individuals, na means number of alleles, and so on. This I have only showed for one, one clade, one for central. Go on to the next slide, please. Now all the other clades are there. But you see, Galahari I left out in this page because Galahari is only one, one clade, so only one group. There is no different groups within that clade. So four of them, each one. But the first one is the one I explained. Then you have the second, third, fourth, and uh, second, third, and fourth clade in the same same table. Okay. So you can analyze them by looking at the looking at the paper and reading the paper. Go to the go to the next slide, please. We will discuss it. We are coming closer to the end of the presentation. What are we discussing? Again, I'm going to summarize them without overloading you with the information. And here is the phylogeography. That is the first one. The study of historical processes, which may be responsible for the past to present distribution of the genealogical lineages. The most striking result in this study is high genetic variation within the Barimia complex throughout a very small geographic range in the mountains. If you look at it, it is one country, one mountain range, and for a small mountain range, this is a very high genetic variation. We found very strong correlations between genetic and geomorphological structures, like for example, ravines, wadis, pools, barriers presenting mixing of waters, and so on, we found very strong correlations. This is with regard to the phylogeography. Next slide, please. Hybridization. There are mixed genotypes between the clades. And this showed us that there is some degree of hybridization. The high indication of hybridization between the clades was only found in three out of the 37 sites. This is based on the microsatellite data. This closely, this affects the closely related clades, East and Galahari, but also more distant clades, East and North. So the hybridization happens, but not very common, three out of 37 sites, but in different clades, close clades, far away clades. And so we think, we believe that the hybridization is a more recent phenomenon. It is not happening for a longer time. That means they would have more sites would have shown hybridization, but since it is showing very few sites, we think it's the hybridization is a more recent phenomenon in this group. Next slide, please. The relationship between clades and possible origin of the age of clades. This is the next one which we looked at discussion. As I told you, Krukenhauser questioned the monophyly. Monof monophyly of Barimia. The presented data did not provide sufficient information regarding the monophyly. Collectively, analysis of mitochondrial and the NC data clearly shows five differentiated groups. Okay, so monophyly, we don't have sufficient information to support monophyly. So Krukenhauser may be right. It may not be a monophyletic taxa. Collectively, there are five differentiated groups. So what we did was we did an analysis called SAMOVA. And SAMOVA resulted in four significant groups. But I want you to be very careful in listening to me. We identified five clades. But SAMOVA, when we did the analysis using SAMOVA, it showed us four significantly divergent groups, not five, four. The only difference was the central and Galahari came in the same cluster. So we had a problem. How do we explain this? We did the genetic analysis. We got five clades. We are now verifying it using SAMOVA 
and it is giving us four clicks. Central and Gallagher are coming together in one cluster. What is the reason for that? So we think that the reason is there is a comparatively low genetic but high differences. Okay, go to the previous slide, please. I still want to be in the previous slide. Okay, we think the comparatively low genetic but high geographic distances between Central and Gallagher. So this is why they are put together. Genetic variation is low, geographic distances are high. So when we are putting them based on the genetic distances, they are putting them into the one clay. This is what we think is happening. Go to the next slide, please. When I gave this talk somewhere else to my postgraduate students, the question is, what is Samoa? If you take in any course in population genetics, then you would have come across this software called Samoa 2.0 version. Okay, it implements an approach to define groups of populations that are geographically homogeneous, but maximally differentiated from each other. Geographically, they are together homogeneous populations, but genetically, they are differentiated from each other. And as a byproduct, this particular software will tell you the identification of genetic barriers between these groups. This is completely based on physics. This method is based on simulated annealing procedure that aims to maximize the proportion of total genetic variance due to differences between groups of populations. Samova means spatial analysis of molecular variants. Okay, this annealing procedure and all that, it is all physics, but it is an adaption of the physical method to genetic analysis, population genetic analysis. If you want to see this method, it is described, I have given the reference, it is also there in the paper, you can pick up the reference, and some of it is available, it runs on Windows, so you can run, but if you have the raw data to run Samova, it will tell you, the program will tell you what kind of input you require. And then from there, you can analyze geographically homogeneous populations, but genetically variable within themselves. Okay, next slide, please. Then the species delimitation is the next discussion. They are pitchler told us that there is morphologically variability, but there is not a single character. Usually when you go to a species, one or two characters will tell you that these are different species from each other. But here there are variabilities, but there is no single character. There's a combination of character. And most of the clades, they have overlapping characters. So it is very difficult to distinguish them morphologically. Okay, if it is one character or two characters, we can say, hey, this is green, this is blue, this is red, and this is uh, long, this is short. We couldn't do that in Gara Barinia. And they were all overlapping all over the place. So it is morphologically very difficult. So we need genetic methods. We need the molecular methods. Okay, and when we are doing the barcoding thing, in an in a increased frequency, we are now finding cryptic species and pseudo cryptic species and so on. Okay, but there is no common criteria for defining cryptic species. What is a cryptic species? You can't generalize. It has been used inconsistently throughout the literature. It depends on People working on fish is doing one thing, earthworm is doing another thing. Each organism group is using cryptic species in a different way. So we don't have a uniform terminology or a definition of a cryptic species. Morphologically indistinguishable clades, right? But genetically they are different. We call them cryptic species. That is the best we can do at this particular point. Go to the next slide, please. We can conclude and I have taken nine minutes more than the normal time given to me, but uh, it was necessary because of the complexity of the subject. In the present study, the genetic variability and phylogeographic pattern 
in the northern oman is investigated so you listen to me patiently so far and the high genetic resistances between mitochondrial clades comparable to distances between other species of the genus corresponding to different clades we compared them it is comparable to others so we think that these cryptic species should be considered as distinct species and my colleagues have gone ahead and they have already done that and two new species have been described two cryptic species which came out of this has now been described as new species and we think that the others will also soon will follow resulting in the revision of the para barimia complex okay we cannot morphologically distinguish them unambiguous really so therefore therefore we believe that there are lots of cryptic species and all our evidence points to that very clearly based on the mitochondrial markers and the microsatellite loci we are very sure that that we have we are dealing with the cryptic species again please next slide next slide okay if you look at the barimia and the iucn category they call it least concern but the middle east region is undergoing very big change environmentally and there is a lot of habitat destruction water shortage chemical pollution and so on so barimia is sitting in extreme habitats and they are very vulnerable and so like the updated species of five independent lineages in this group and we have to rethink the conservation reassessment of gara barimi instead of simply saying that it is least concern because we think it is there everywhere but we think what is there everywhere is not one species but several cryptic species and hidden diversity so there is a case to protect the hidden diversity in this particular particular group of fish next slide please blank slide and i want you to want you to uh ask any questions if you have i uh, anything anything you need to ask i may be able to answer and but that's all i have to say thank you very much for listening to me and apologies to the organizers for overshooting the time a little bit and they are not cutting me off they are kind enough uh so so if there is anything you want me to ask uh, i will tell you if i know Th that thank you sir for the informative and interesting lecture now the session is open for discussion i request the participants to voice out their questions or type the questions in the chat box Good morning, sir. This is Luth Mary. Yes, sir. Uh, highly interested and uh, very informative uh, lecture I was able to hear after a long time. And uh, I have a small uh, uh, doubts, basic doubts, uh, okay. in my research based on what you have also taught me in my PhD. Uh, this um, sampling, for example, for in a genetic analysis, you have taken enormous samples. Uh, it means that you need to sequence all of them and then go one by one to make a clad and analyze them or from the database you could analyze and confirm no we we did uh, we did the analysis on individual samples like if we had 43 specimens as much as possible we we did all the 43 specimens Mm. and if we had 632 we need because we wanted the intra specific variation as well if you group them if you group the samples okay there are two danger uh, two dangerous uh, possibilities in doing that when you are taking a group of specimens you may be mixing them because if they are morphologically indistinguishable you may be mixing two different different types yes. two different morphological yes. type thinking that they are the same species so but if you are doing them individually as much as possible 
in this case depending on your resource you can you can reduce the number of specimens as much as possible but you have to be representative in choosing your specimens and if possible do all the specimens you you have in your hand and that is the best way to to do the analysis if you are interested in finding intra specific differences and if there are intra specific differences it will show up in your in your analysis otherwise when you when you start grouping them i have seen people for example like they take a bunch of organisms and put them together like for example very small organisms like daphnia for example they put them together as uh, uh, you know they like weigh them 2 ml to 2 grams of uh, daphnia and they grind them all together and then they start analyzing for thing then they will say they well they are all from the same population uh, that's okay if you are sure about that that you are dealing with the same population if you raise them yourself and you know that it is from the same population that's fine otherwise in cases like fish for example it is individual uh, individuals are much better for analysis thank you sir this has lessened my burden of you no know, doing uh, in earthworms also because we shouldn't consider uh, the earthworms that we collect from one location to be of same species there could be intra species also and uh, one more thing yes um, regarding mm. yeah go ahead go ahead i will i will comment mm. later regarding that uh, genotype that you are working on that um, uh, micro satellite yeah um, does it uh, mean that there is any polymorphism that is happening within the micro satellite sequences say that again polymorphic forms aha uh -huh. in the micro satellite regions that you are analyzing yeah micro satellite region is very 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 reliable in terms of finding the differences in the nuclear nucleotide diversity sometimes you see we have in the past actually actually you know like uh, i worked with a uh, with a professor in um, uh, singapore university once we have a similar situation regarding the regarding the juniper trees in the same mountains they are all over the place so some people said that they might have been isolated over a long period of time and so if you use the genetic analysis you may be coming up with differences of different populations of these trees and we have to use the plastids in order to do the do the sequencing and all that at the end of the day we didn't come across any differences Uh, all over the mountain so we covered about 300 400 kilometers of this mountain stretch and then uh, came up with different populations and we ended up with the same species but we found out that the species which we were identifying was not the same as the ones which we had actually the ones we had was the same as the ones which were in iran which we didn't know that was a finding but within the population we didn't find any difference throughout the mountain so when i was talking about this to this professor he told me why don't you try micro satellite markers and when we found micro satellite markers we found population differences between the trees in different areas geographical areas so what mitochondrial markers gave us was not completely 100% correct it just gave us a general picture of what the species was but it didn't tell us any population differences but the micro satellite markers are very useful in bringing that out and if you have non controlling uh, micro satellite markers in the literature also you can you can find that why micro satellite markers are more reliable in some of the genetic analysis but micro satellite markers requires designing primers that's where the problem is the problem is that you have to be an expert in order to design the primers right if you make mistakes in designing the primers like for example we have to put sandra through the grind before she started designing primers lot of false starts you know the primer will not work so we have to we have to retry it again and and again and all that so it is a little bit laborious but more reliable so if you have an opportunity to look at the 
macrocytolite markers, I would advise you to do them. But you can do one thing. We looked at 19 different markers. You may not want 19 markers. Okay, but you may want to look at a few of the markers. And when you are looking at the sequence and say that, okay, these markers look promising. And this is by trial and error. So you can, you can try that. But uh, instead of just using the mitochondrial markers like the oxidase and cytochrome B and uh, uh, control region long and control region short and so on, uh, microbiocytolite matter gives you a better, better uh, clarification of the genetic analysis. Thank you very much, sir. It's really nice and enlightening that we need to validate again. We need not rely on mitochondrial uh, genes alone that microsatellite needs to be also carried out. Yeah, nowadays, nowadays I, I tell you, Louis Mary, there is one problem. If you are using sometimes just the mitochondrial markers alone, you have difficulty in publishing internationally. Mm. They, they want more, more information. If in literature, in your literature, in your subject, if anybody has done any microsatellite marker, or anything like that, they would demand that you also do the same thing in order to compare. Yeah. So using mm -hmm. microbiome marker alone may not be enough sometimes, depending upon where you want to publish it. Mm -hmm. That is also becoming a bit of a bit of a problem. And nowadays, you know, like uh, even when you are registering the sequences, okay, yes. Numbers are becoming more and more. Now, if you have anything less than 1,000 uh, base pairs, they are not accepting uh, accepting them in the journals. You can register them. They give you an accession number. But when you go to the journal and try to publish it, he say, go and do it again for uh, 1,000 ba base pairs. One, then one, only then we will we'll do that. We were, we were doing some fungus uh, oil degrading fungus and we were doing some sequencing and they, they, they demanded more than 1000 base pairs so although we had an accession number they wouldn't accept that accession number so it depends it depends on the field uh, for example i just wanted to ask you when you did the earthworm thing did you use group individuals or you use individual earthworms no no individuals only a clitellar region where the amount of DNA yield would be yield was better and good, so we used only part of it. We are thinking of getting a tail tip or the prostomium, allowing the earthworm to regenerate. That I am having it in mind that we may not sacrifice the animal, help them to regenerate, and then even throw. This this, this worms came from a monoculture. No, sir. It's oh, it's just taken randomly from the campus sites. Yeah, and this then is we are just problem. trying to the, the earthworm diversity is very difficult morphology because like when we studied the atoms in zoology in in Madhuri university american college and so on they gave us the name of a species and they said this is the species we are looking at say for example rana hexadactyla everybody says rana hexadactyla okay it took me several years to find out Rana exodactyla is not Rana exodactyla. It had Tigrina, it had Pepe, it had all sorts of three or four species of Rana in, in them. But everything was Rana hexadactyla for us. Similarly, for earthworm, but, but I worked with, a, with an American guy on earthworm di diversity as a summer job. My job is to go collecting earthworm, digging them in the, in the, in the, far, in the temperate forests in the north. Okay, and I, I realized that how many genera and, and species of earthworm can be found in one square meter of the soil. So it, it, it is a difficult thing, but, but if you are doing genetic analysis, if you get various sequences, don't get surprised. Most probably they belong to different, uh, different species. But if you are doing a vermiculture, and if it is a monoculture of the same earthworm, then it will be more reliable. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so you're you're very true. Uh, when we were doing some random sampling, you also had a standard uh, cultivated uh, earthworm to just mm. check whether the procedure works, and we also be able to confirm that the uh, uh, cultivable species to belong to that uh, species which we bought it, like Icenia. We had a mm. parallel thing, and we are now mm. able to disclose the new thing that we have randomly selected and uh, worked out. We have got the sequence. We are able to get the accession and get it, uh, you know, uh, checked for the barcoding and then for the species level. Mm. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Another, another, another thing you can do is when you are doing this, you can use the morphological taxonomy as a basis. It is always better to have a key for identifying the species morphologically, then label them according to that, and then when you do the sequencing, you don't have to uh, to work with the whole jumble of sequences and start separating them. You will say that uh, you know type A, type B, type C, depending upon the morphological thing. Like for example, in the earthworm, for example, the confounding factor is if you are counting the number of segments, they never tell you that it is 17 segments or 18 segment or 19 segment. They tell you between 17 and 19, between 16 and 19, like that. Th there will be variations. So you have to, you can have a morphological basis to make your life easier when you are doing the the genetic, uh, the mitochondrial, I mean, the DNA sequencing and so on. That's also another, another way of doing it. Thank you very much, sir.